talk about tomatoes. I, I was going to, as George mentioned, uh, I appreciate the introduction. I actually work for the Department of Agriculture, so that's the building you might recognize. It's like that. It's right across the street from the Boyce Thompson Institute, or just down the street uh, from us here. Um, so I just thought I'd mention a little bit about the USDA lab, since this is especially for the interns and you guys might be thinking about what you want to do with your lives. Uh, I could tell you don't work for the USDA, but uh, it's actually not a bad place to work, and it's a little different if you're thinking of an academic career. Uh, there are other options. Uh, Department of Agriculture has about 3,000 uh, PhD scientists scattered around the country. Uh, there's some in pretty much every state, and they have a little bit of a different role than, for example, a professor here at Cornell. You don't teach normally if you're a USDA scientist. Although sometimes if you sit somewhere like the university campus, you do a little bit. But it's more of a 100% research type position. Um, and uh, the, the center here is called the Robert W. Hawley Center for Agriculture and Health. The USDA labs typically have a mission. Right? So ours is agriculture as it relates to human health and nutrition. And Robert Hawley is this guy. Uh, and he's an interesting person for two reasons. They're related. He was a scientist here uh, a number of years ago. He's deceased now. But he is the only USDA scientist to ever win a Nobel Prize. Uh, so we have that distinction here on campus. Uh, right after he won the Nobel Prize, Cornell hired him. So they stole him away so they could add him to their collection of Nobel laureates. Um, but uh, he won, won the Nobel Prize, and you'd probably be surprised for what? He was the first person to ever sequence a nucleic acid. So you guys think about DNA sequencing all the time. He actually sequenced the tRNA, but that was the first nucleic acid ever sequenced anything. Um, and he did it in that building. And there's some old pictures, unfortunately I don't have them here, where he actually ran these huge columns through the stairwells um, just to sequence a handful of nucleotides that now you guys just send off to a service center who do millions and millions and millions of bases for you for a couple of bucks. Uh, but that was the first one, and he got the Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology and Medicine for doing that. So that's just a little bit of an interesting entree. There's some really good scientists at the USDA lab here. Um, there just, there's more than who I showed you here, but just to point out a few of them, uh, working on different things from some of the disease problems in citrus, to maize genetics, to uh, important problems for growing potatoes, and particularly pathogens, to big databases that people all over the world use. Um, so there, there's some pretty exciting research that goes on in the USDA in general, and probably one of the best USDA labs, if I don't say so myself, is right here at Cornell. Um, and so Ed Buckler, for example, two years ago, won the first National Academy of Science prize in food and agriculture. So that's kind of like the Nobel Prize for food and agriculture. A hundred thousand bucks to put in his pocket for that. So you don't have, it's not always a, a poor man's job to be a scientist. Um, of course, working for the USDA, they made it real difficult for me to take it. But um, anyway, all right, so that, that's just the introduction to the USDA. If you're interested at lunchtime, we can talk more about that. Um, happy to talk to you about that or anything you want. But I, I'm going to mostly talk about, for the next little while, uh, tomatoes. And um, tomatoes, our lab works on fruit. So it's tomato and fruit. Okay. But we often, many people will say it's a vegetable, right? And that's really because of how we use it culturally. We don't think of it as a fruit. But it has seeds. Anything that has seeds in it is botanically a fruit. Okay, and we, I'll tell you why we work on it for a number of reasons, but it turns out it's just a really easy system to work with. And these are some of the wild relatives of tomato. So actually, all of them are interfertile with the cultivated tomatoes. You can cross any of these to the cultivated tomato, but the cultivated tomato, that is the tomato you buy in the grocery store, is really a derivative of this wild species, Solanum cryptanella folium. It's a little tiny berry. It's the only red one, so that's part of the reason it's the basis of, of the modern tomato. And it's really just a couple of domestication traits, a couple of genes that make it this tomato, mostly related to fruit size. 
Okay? Um, and you can see a lot of them are green, they could be other colors, orange, which is beta carotene, this is lycopene that makes a tomato red. They're one step away from each other in the carotenoid synthesis pathway, uh, but only pimpinella folium goes red. All right, you can have fun with tomatoes. You know, these slides, this is the Tomatina Festival in Spain, and now they have these festivals all over the place. Um, but they basically uh, get a lot of rotten tomatoes, and they throw them at each other, and it looks kind of fun. Um, you can even go to these kind of things here in the U.S. So there's at least 25 states that have tomato festivals. Uh, only a few that actually have ones, most of them they just eat tomatoes and have tomato pies and that kind of stuff. But a few where you can actually throw them at each other. This is actually Soldier Field in Chicago. Um, so they do something there every year. This is, I think, in Wisconsin. Um, forget, well, one of these is called the Tomato Palooza. So, um, and the point here, actually, besides just having some fun slides, is tomatoes and many fruit get soft. And that's one of the big challenges of uh, getting fruit to market um, in, a, in a manner that's acceptable to consumers. So a little bit of uh, fruit morphology. There are many different kinds of fruit. There are fruits who have been engineered by evolution to blow around, to stick to fur of animals. And a lot of times they're really about how do you disperse seeds, right? How do you get the seeds? How do you get the next generation away from the parent? Right? You don't want them necessarily germinating at the foot of uh, the parent that bore them. Sometimes that can be through mechanical dispersal, where literally pressure is built up and the seeds just blow out. Sometimes they blow around. And what we're interested in are so-called fleshy fruit, fruit that have uh, co-evolved with the animals to be eaten, and then the animals disperse the seed somewhere else. Okay. So, and of course, uh, many of those are most interesting to us because we do consume them. We consume some of the others as well, um, uh, but also thinking primarily or mainly for their seeds. All right. So I always like to just put a little bit in perspective. You know, why, why do we care about fruit? Well, fruit are an important part of human diets. Hopefully you all eat some once in a while. Um, the population of the world, as you know, is growing. And a big challenge is with a limited amount of agricultural land, how do you keep producing enough food for a growing population? Even though projections are that that population growth will tail off because people live longer, the actual population is going to keep growing for quite some time. So how do you sustainably feed that population? And um, so that's a challenge, and I'm sure you'll, you'll often see in plant biology slides these kinds of, um, uh, or talks these kinds of slides, just because this is how we justify what we're doing. Um, and you know, breeders have done a good job of increasing um, how much we produce. But something I think we don't often think about unless we're thinking about fruits and vegetables in particular, is that a lot of that equation of how much do you have uh, depends upon how much you actually get to the consumer, right? So um, how much is lost? And fruits and vegetables in particular are very susceptible to post-harvest pathogenesis. They rot, right? You keep fruit around on your counter shelf, it goes bad after a um, So, and at the same time, Many of the staples are often seeds or tubers, uh, things that evolution has engineered to last a long time, to overwinter, to be stable till the next uh, season, the next generation. So seeds are typically easy to store. You don't lose so much of them. But fruits and vegetables, we have to put a lot of energy and a lot of money into it, refrigeration, things like that. Um, and they, we still lose a lot. And particularly in the developing world, oftentimes more than half of what's produced will be lost before it ever gets to market or ever gets consumed. So it, without even producing more, if we can change that equation to getting more of it to the market without losing it, we have a net increase in yield without actually having to excuse me, increase production a whole lot. Uh, another thing to think about, um, just thinking about plants, and some of you working in plant path labs 
probably starting to think about this. Plants do a lot of work. They spend a lot of energy, a lot of their chemistry defending themselves against pathogens, right? against things that are going to eat them or invade them. Um, and a fleshy fruit is really unique in that it undergoes this developmental program that is all designed to say, at the end of the day, come and get me and eat me. Right? What part of the plant does that? But just the fruit. And so typically what happens uh, are a number of things. You know if you eat fruits, they look different, they have different colors, different flavors. But there's some general features of what happens when they mature and ripen. Typically starch is converted to sugar, so they taste good. Texture typically gets soft. They often change colors. The colors can be different. And the tomato, as I said before, it's primarily lycopene, uh, which is a carotenoid with high antioxidant value. Um, in grapes, for example, they're flavonoids, uh, strawberries, xanthocyanins. Um, but they typically or often will change color. They reduce the levels of protective compounds, the things that are keeping things away from consuming them. Uh, that might make you sick, for example, if you ate an unripe fruit. Uh, those are reduced in their levels. Aroma volatiles are produced, so things that make them smell good. And what's interesting, often some of those really pleasing smells of, of fruits are derived from essential amino acids. So they're essential amino acids or other essential nutrients that are volatilized. You perceive that as a desirable smell, but it's actually the fact that you and other animals have evolved to recognize that as a source of a necessary nutrient. So aroma can be very uh, important for uh, making consumers aware of the fruit. And also pathogen susceptibility in general goes up. And that's really escape plan B for the seed. So the reason fruits rot so easily is because if something doesn't come along and eat them, you don't want the seeds trapped in this impenetrable fortress. You want them to get out one way or another. So the tissue rots and something, uh, uh, and then those seeds can then be liberated and germinate. So we're really interested in understanding that process of you know, what, what regulates this transition. And that's what I'll spend most of the rest of the time talking to you about. Um, but did just want to remind you a little bit about flavor, because particularly with tomato, and I think many fruits, people are really focused more and more on flavor. So I have something for you. Someone in my lab saw this and said, oh, they're going to think you're giving them cake. <laughs> I'm not. Um, they would be much more disappointed. And uh, I'll just maybe let you pass this tray around, and at least until they run out, Take a cup, unless you're allergic to tomatoes, then pass it on. Some people are. Um, we've had a few people that have developed allergies to tomatoes just because they're around them so much. Okay. Um, so I'll let that pass around. And basically what's in there is in the cup, there are three tomatoes. And it's, it's really just to show you, hopefully if it makes it correct. <laughs> Uh, to show you just a couple of things that you probably are already aware of, but to think of a little bit more about now. One, they're different colors. Right? So some of the, if you went to the supermarket 10, 15 years ago, you'd probably pretty much see red tomatoes. Now you can go, if you go to Wegmans, you'll see a half dozen different colors. Right? You'll see red-orange, you'll see the kind of brown-colored ones here, which are actually tomatoes that keep their green, and then get the red pigment on top. So if you ever got green and red crayons, you get kind of brown, that's the brown one. Uh, you get yellow ones, uh, even white ones. And these are all mostly different steps that are mutated in the carotenoid synthesis pathway that result in these different colors. And the other reason I'm passing them around is uh, don't hesitate to take them out of the cups, smell them. You'll probably notice that, although maybe not so much since they're rubbing together, they smell different. Eat them, please. Um, person who put them in the little cups for you washed her hands before. Um, and uh, uh, they'll taste it, right? And basically, because they have different levels of volatiles, different levels of sugars, um, and uh, the, the brownish ones in particular have more of what people refer to as a grassy or vegetative flavor, because they have a little more of the kind of unripe uh, 
flavor notes to them. And if you want, while you're eating them, take a bite of one, as you normally would, save the other half for a minute, and then hold your nose. The other half. And you'll notice it tastes different. Right? And you can do that with anything you eat that has any aroma to it, which is most foods one way or another. And that's because your sensation of taste is not just your tongue. Your tongue does, and you can see I took a picture off the web I should have done. Don't tell. Um, so different parts of your tongue taste different things. But also part of your sense of your perception of flavor is based on aroma. And a couple of things happen. One is just that aroma you get putting it under your nose, but also once you bite it, a lot of volatiles are released, and those go up through the back of your nasal cavity and hit the same olfactory receptor. So you get different aromas once you chew something. Okay? And th this slide is a, a, just makes the point that you know, there's a lot of quality, what we refer to as quality of a fruit or vegetable or any food, that isn't just how it tastes in your mouth. It has to feel the way you expect it to feel, right? A, a mealy peach is really unpleasant, even if the flavor might not be much different, but it just tastes wrong in your mouth. Same with a soft apple. Um, so, and also needs to look right, or else it just doesn't quite appeal to you the same way. So there's a lot of attributes. And a lot of these, the whole point of this, a lot of these are just related to transitions that occur during that ripening process. Okay? So I hopefully convinced you fruit ripening is important. Why do we work on tomato? There's a number of reasons. One, uh, it's really easy to grow. It's kind of like a weed. That's part of the reason a lot of people grow them at home, because they're easy to grow. You water them, you put a little fertilizer, it's like you freeze them, they're probably going to do okay. Um, they're easy to cross. So, and there's a lot of, as I showed you in that first slide, a lot of diversity, genetic diversity, wild species, also a lot of uh, cultivated varieties that you can cross. Look at variation and use genetics to inform you about what underlies that variation, what the genes are, uh, what regulates traits, how complicated they are genetically, and all the questions you can ask with a genetic analysis. They're easy to transform. That is, we can make GMO tomatoes real easily. Right? And why do we do that? We mostly do it to ask, what is the function of a gene? We knock it out. We overexpress it. We understand more about it. It's just like you guys are too young now. Your cars are too complicated. But in the old days, when your car broke down, that's how you figured out how it worked. Because you could probably fix it yourself. Now you got to take it to a mechanic who figures out what computer board to throw away and replace it. With. Uh, but when things break is how you understand how they work. And mutants are just broken genetics. And that's how we understand the genetics that make something like tomato fruit ripening happen. Uh, more recently, there's a lot of really useful genomics tools. There's a good genome sequence. There's a lot of expression data. So it's an easy system relatively to work. It's also important. It's the most valuable fruit crop, even though a lot of people won't recognize it fruit in the world. $63 billion of tomatoes are produced and sold throughout the world. That's twice the value of bananas, which you probably, if I asked you before, you might have thought bananas was the biggest crop just because you see them in any supermarket. And even something like coffee is only worth about $10 billion a year. So tomatoes are very valuable. In the U.S. we produce about $3 billion worth. About half of them you eat fresh and about half are your salsa pasta sauce and that kind of It's also a relative of a lot of important other species. So tomato, if you look at the genome, compared to the genome of potato, at a gross level, orders of genes, you can make five inversions in tomato and make a genome that looks a heck of a lot like the potato genome. You make about 50 and you get pepper. Something in between, you get eggplant. And there's even a lot of easily observable conservation when you get out to <coughs> coffee. So coffee is a more distant relative of tomato. In our lab, we have a little project on coffee, just trying to ask how many of the regulatory things in coffee are the same in a tomato. Or we have more information. All right. So just, again, kind of from a crop perspective, let's say you're interested in maize, 
biggest crop grown in the U.S., about 30, 40 billion dollars a worth, worth a year, so 10 times what tomatoes worth. But if you add these four vegetables together, you get almost halfway there to the value of, of maize. So uh, it is an important crop economically. So now let's start talking a little bit about ripening before we run out of time. Uh, what's the ripening hormone? Anybody know the hormone that people think of as the ripening hormone? <laughs> ethylene, thank you. Okay. So ethylene's a gas, so it's a weird hormone on top of everything else. It's, a, it's volatile. It moves through the air, so ethylene produced in one tomato can influence another. Ethylene produced in a different plant can influence a fruit on another plant. All right? So, and ethylene turns out, again, to be really important, not just for the biology of the fruit, but also practically, economically. All the bananas you see in the grocery store come in green. They gas them with ethylene to promote ripening. Why do they do that? Because bananas, like tomatoes, like most fruits, get soft. And they're really hard to ship soft. So you ship them hard, basically you ship them unripe, you treat with ethylene, you induce ripening, they look good, and a lot of times people say, oh, they don't taste so great, particularly with tomatoes. If you've ever been to a country where you can get a fresh banana off a banana tree, you would know that bananas also taste terrible. But we don't have the perspective, most of us. So a fresh banana is much more fruity, much di completely different flavor. And I think as people get further and further away from you know, kind of local agriculture, away from the farm, they don't realize how many fruits have lost a lot of their quality. But it's out of the necessity of the only way you can get them to market in a, in a reasonably economical manner is to harvest essentially unripe and then induce ripening later on. And usually it's never as complete. Okay, but ethylene will do that. So you can take a fruit that's unripe, gas it with ethylene, induce the ripening process. But what's interesting is that only works for a little while, a window before normal ripening. If you do it too early, fruit won't ripen. And that's important to us because that tells us there's a transition where the tissue gains a competence to respond to the hormone. That's where we want to look for important changes that are controlling the rest of the ripening. So that transition, and this classically by physiologists who you know, look for things to label so they can have a legacy, call that system one and two ethylene. It doesn't mean anything other than early ethylene won't promote ripening, later ethylene. Okay, so that, that tells us where to work. These are just stages, so we refer to this as mature green, the fruit's full size. The seeds are what's mature, so you can take them out and germinate them. Fruit's obviously not ripe. This we call BR, or breaker, color break, first signs of color. That's red ripe. This is immature and later immature. So those are just terms we use to just help us define the process. It's easy when you're asking, well, what controls it? I told you before how important this is all about seed dispersal. So it would make sense that those seeds maturing might give a signal that says, okay, we're ready to go now, ripen the fruit. And, but you also know, whether you realize it or not, you definitely know that there are plenty of fruits that you eat that have no seeds. These are so-called parthenocarpic fruits. So uh, they're, they're essentially mutants, or uh, essentially mostly mutants that don't produce seed. They, of course, wouldn't survive in the wild, but since we propagate them, they do. And what they show you is that actually the fruit will ripen without seed. Uh, but we know that they typically ripen slower, so that's good for the production side of things. Um, and they produce a hormone, that cysic acid, that is known in many fruits to be necessary as an early regulator of ripening, even before ethylene. So it may well be that while they can ripen, the seeds are still pretty important as an early signal, and that's one of the things we're trying to understand. Yeah. Are they really important and how important are they? Okay, so I thought I'd give you a little more background of just some of the interesting tomato, fruit things that have been discovered. Um, um, just uh, because I thought that would make tomato a little more relevant to you. So who's heard of flavor saver tomato? 
right? So the first GMO product ever produced was a tomato. <coughs> it was called Flavor Saver. And the gene that was targeted was a gene that breaks down the cell wall. And the reason this was thought to be interesting was, well, let's kind of think of like bricks in a building. The cell wall, in this particular case, the, the middle lamella of the cell wall, is what holds those bricks together. So normally in a ripening tomato, an enzyme called polygalacturonase is strongly induced. It's 1% of the mRNA in a ripe fruit. So 35,000 genes, but one of them is accounting for one of every 100 messages. So it's cranked way up. And it breaks down that little lamella between the cells. And the idea was, well, that's what makes everything start getting squishy. Right? So knock that gene out, you get a nice ripe tomato that stays firm. So that's the panacea for people who care about stuff like this. Um, how do you get a firm but high quality, good tasting tomato? So that's what Flavor Saver was supposed to be. It didn't work. Um, and the, the, what was really interesting, people don't usually appreciate the story, they just know it was out there for a little while and it went away. And what, re what really happened was it never did what it was supposed to do. But the company, Calgene, that developed it was pretty sharp. And what they realized was they get just as soft, but they don't rot as easily. Because the cell wall turns out, softening is much more complicated than that one enzyme. But that breakdown of the middle lamella is an important feature of why fruit rot. Stuff can get in easier. It's pretty simple. And so they lasted longer, even though they were still squishy. So what they did was pack them like peaches in these eight carton type boxes so they wouldn't bang into each other. And they put them in test markets in Chicago and San Francisco, and they actually sold every fruit they could get out for about three times the then market price for tomatoes. People liked them. They had little brochures that said what they were, what GMO was, all this kind of stuff. And they were probably in two of the most difficult places to try and test market. But then what happened was Monsanto bought Calgene and said, can't make enough money off the tomatoes, so they just took it off. So that, that's the real flavor saver story. And they turned Calgene into a seed oil company. Um, so, okay, but it was the first GM product. Again, one of the main features of tomato is lycopene. Like if he's a carotenoid, this is a carotenoid synthesis pathway. There will be a test at the end of the lecture. You have to memorize all the enzymes and steps. Uh, lycopene is red. And these are some of the mutants. So you've probably seen tomatoes in the supermarket that look like some of these. The orange one you had in your little cup, that's uh, a lycopene beta cyclase mutation. So what normally happens in a ripening tomato is this step here, the first committed step, toward these carotenoids, that gene gets cranked up, ethylene pushes it on, right? This gene that goes from lycopene red to beta carotene orange gets shut off. So everything backs up here and you turn red. If you've ever grown tomatoes in your garden and paid attention, you'll notice they get orange before they get red. And that's because you're seeing the transition where ethylene's coming up, shutting off this step of the pathway, and then everything's accumulating there. And if you look at different varieties, you'll see different amounts of lycopene and beta carotene. You don't usually see the beta carotene because this masks it, but depending on the variety, you'll, you'll get anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of the carotenoids will actually be beta carotene. Beta carotene is, a, is your body will convert it to vitamin A. So it's essentially a necessary nutrient. So there's a lot of interest in elevating beta carotene in lots of crops, including golden rice, right? So golden rice is an attempt to get beta carotene by pushing this pathway, which normally is not expressed very much at all in a rice grain, but cranking it up so that you can accumulate basically vitamin A, or vitamin A precursors that have a lot of uh, positive consequences, particularly in parts of the world where you don't get enough vitamin A, you get a lot of blindness and other Okay, but a lot of this pathway has been worked out by looking at tomato mutants and studying changes in tomato. The ethylene synthesis pathway was worked out in tomato. I won't belabor that. And now I'll transition for the last bit of the talk to some of the stuff we're doing. We're really interested in mutants, as I said before, and mutants like this. This one's called ripening inhibitor. 
And you can see that single gene mutation and the fruit just don't ripen. Okay? They're green, they're basically stuck at that mature green stage. The seeds are viable, you can grow them up, but the fruit don't ripen. So that means something pretty important is wrong in this mutation. Okay? It's actually widely used. So little tomatoes like these won't carry it, but most every supermarket tomato you buy carries the red mutation. Why? Could that be, you say, when it looks like this? Well, if you make a hybrid, you get a slow ripening, long shelf life, and kind of pinkish, lighter colored tomato. You probably see those in the supermarket. And the breeders have done a good job. They've, they get fairly red these days, but they're basically uh, heterozygous mutants of a gene that's necessary for ripening. And it slows the process down when you have only one instead of two copies of that gene. Of the gene. And so most commercial varieties now will carry this mutation. And that gives them another two weeks or so of shelf life as a result. All right. So I won't go into it. It turns out the mutation is a little more interesting than we initially realized. Uh, but the bottom line is it's a transcription factor. It's a member of the Madsbox protein family. And these are genes that regulate other genes. It's an interesting mutation. It's a deletion. And the result of that deletion is actually fusing of two genes together, but with removal of parts of both of those genes. So you get this chimeric mRNA. If you uh, transform the mutant with just this gene, you recover the ripening phenotype. So that's here. I didn't point this out before, though actually I think you can see it here. Another phenotype is very large sepals. Right? So it doesn't ripen, has large sepals. The other gene, if you knock it out, you get very large sequels. So, but it doesn't in, impact the ripening of the It's not very much. So two different genes are altered in this mutation. One is influencing ripening, one's influencing sequel size. Turns out that family, the Mansbox family, if you're familiar with these at all, maybe from a, a developmental biology course, often Mans genes are talked about. They're conserved in eukaryotes. In humans, they control things like muscle development. In plants, they're generally associated with floral development. So a lot of interesting mutations in, in uh, plants and flowers, for example, things like leaf, uh, I'm sorry, roses with lots of petals. These are Mads box mutations. Carnations with this proliferation of petals. These are Mads box mutations. Um, turns out a lot of them are also important in fruit, so i just show that here to indicate that there are other genes in this family that if you knock them out, you can get some phenotypes similar, for example, to Rin. You can also change morphology of parts of the flower or the pet cell uh, or the petals in this case, or other ripening phenotypes as shown. Okay? This is another one uh, that you, if you think or look at your tomatoes, uh, some basic features, you've got the seeds, You've got the pericarp, this harder tissue on the outside, and then you have the locule. This is a gene that is actually involved in controlling that breakdown of the locule to make it liquidy. And if you overexpress it, this is a transgenic tomato, overexpressing it, you basically turn the whole fruit into a locule, so you turn it into mush, um, which is kind of cool, probably not too useful. But it, as I said, the ability to readily make a transgenic plant lets us understand the function of that gene, so we know what that gene is. And knocking it out, which is shown here, has the opposite effect. So you lose that jelly blockule, and now you've got a much firmer, harder fruit. Okay. So an interesting gene. It's necessary for ripening. Is this a tomato thing, or does this matter to other fruits? Well, you can find genes like this in many other fruits. Uh, so even in monocots, which a banana is, and just as an example with a collaborator in Israel, Haya Friedman, we identified two genes that are similar to the tomato rib gene, made constructs here in our lab to knock them out. Uh, so these were RNAi and antisense constructs. And then uh, in Israel, they generated some transgenic bananas. These are growing outside in the field in Israel. 
And these are fruit from those bananas. And the key point is up here. These are controls. So all of these hands and fingers of bananas are the same age, uh, post-pollination. And you can see that the controls are decaying much more quickly than the transgenics, knocking out either of these genes. So that's one difference in banana. You appear to have two genes that are involved in this ripening function. In tomato, there appears to be only one. But if you knock out either the tomato or the banana gene, you impair the ripening process. Yeah, this just shows that if you then take those ripening impaired fruit, treat them with ethylene, you can recover some of that ripening. You can do the same thing with strawberry, same thing with melons. So the bottom line is this is a gene that's important in controlling ripening and has a conserved function evolutionarily. Right? So that's part of what we're looking for. Things that seem to be important that tell us something about the control of the process, but that also ideally tell us about a lot of things beyond to me. This is a, another really interesting mutant. We didn't, we helped in the cloning of this. It was mostly the work of Graham Seymour in his lab in the UK. It has kind of a similar phenotype, other than this red slash through it. It's a, it's a non-ripening mutant, but it reverts on occasion, and that's what this sector is. So basically a cell that had a mutant reversion, and then it ripens on, in the lineage of cells derived from that uh, early mutant cell. And this is also a transcription factor. It's a different class, SPD box transcription factors. But what's really interesting about this mutation is it's a so-called epi allele. So if you sequence the gene, you won't find any sequence variation. But what you find is a heritable change in methylation of the promoter of this gene. And that methylation results in a lack of activity of the gene, so it won't transcribe. And the net effect is you don't have that gene being expressed. It, it can't do what it normally does in controlling ripening, and the fruit don't ripen. But as typical of these types of mutations, these epigenetic mutations or epi alleles, they tend to revert more frequently than a DNA sequence-based mutation. So sometimes you'll see these kind of reversion phenotypes. This is another member of the MADS family. Uh, called TAGL1, and when we knocked it out, um, we saw phenotypes very similar to the RIN mutation. So the fruit didn't ripen. They also, it's maybe a little hard to see, but I think you can see it, the pericarp compared to the wild type is only about half as thick. So they're not expanding as much. They're not as fleshy as a normal tomato. So this gene turns out to be expressed very early in fruit development, comes back down, and comes back up as the fruit ripens. So it has two roles, one in that early fleshy expansion, and then the other in controlling ripening. And a really neat feature of this gene is if you overexpress it, two things happen. One, one you see here is obvious, and one you don't. What you can see here is it turns the sepals, these leaf-like structures that are part of the flower, essentially into fruit tissues. So they get thick, they get fleshy, they turn red, they taste like a tomato, they smell like a tomato. They basically do everything that we can measure that a tomato uh, pericarp does. The other thing they do when you overexpress this gene, so we put it with 35S, we're basically expressing it all over the plant, everywhere, and the rest of the plant doesn't seem to do anything. The fruit ripen early, but only within that window where ethylene so they ripen a week or so early, but they don't really do anything before that. So it tells us a number of interesting things. One, it's necessary, and when you're thinking of genetics, it's important to distinguish necessity from sufficiency. So it is necessary, you remove it, you break the system. It is not sufficient if you overexpress it. You can't make an, a young fruit ripen, you can't make a leaf ripen, you can't make a root ripen. So it is not a sufficient gene to promote ripening, uh, but it is a necessary change. All right, I think, well, one more here. Um, I have a, way too many slides, so I'll just stop. Them. We can go one. So this is another interesting mutation. It's called NOR, or non-ripening. It looks a lot like RIN, uh, and 
it's a different, again, another class of transcription factors. So interesting, it's also a transcription factor. It's not an ADS gene, it's not an SPD protein. <clears throat> if we reintroduce it with a transgene, we can recover the mutant phenotype. If we knock it out, we can, uh, in a wild type, we can create the mutant phenotype. I'll skip over that. Um, this was just from some work from a former postdoc in the lab, so he's on to took the promoters of all the genes that this protein interacts with and asked, is there a common sequence? And basically came up with a consensus sequence of where this protein went from. So, and like RIN, it turns out that it interacts with the promoters of most of the genes that we can associate with the right brain process. This was a, a former postdoc in the lab, Nigel Gapper, who did some an interesting thing with the NOR gene, kind of going back to this question of, well, how conserved is this through evolution? Are we looking at tomato genes or genes that influence other species as well? Nigel was from, is from New Zealand, and so he was interested naturally in kiwi fruit. It turns out kiwi fruit, you can transform it, but it's hard. It's a tree. It takes you a couple of years to get back a plant that will give you fruit that are doing anything that you could measure. And doubly difficult is that at least in New Zealand, if you make a transgenic kiwi fruit, you gotta keep it in a greenhouse. And once you put a kiwi tree in a greenhouse, you don't get any fruit. So uh, you can't win. So what, what Nigel did was he explored the genome of kiwi, and basically he found three genes that looked a lot like the tomato and orange, and that were expressed in the ripening kiwi fruit. So it was a question of how do we figure out which, if any, of these are important for ripening. So he took all three of them separately and transformed them into the tomato nor mutant and asked, will any of those genes complement the tomato mutation? And so don't be confused because I was saying three genes. These are different transgenic lines from one gene, so nor like three. Okay? So nor like three would complement the tomato. So the other two genes did not. So he basically was able to sort through what is the best candidate for the ripening regulator in kiwi fruit. And now, uh, uh, basically, the equivalent of the USDA in New Zealand is working with this gene to basically go to all the effort of making transgenic plants that probably won't set fruit uh, in a greenhouse and test if it actually is a right gene. Okay, let me, I'm going to skip this stuff and just kind of come here uh, to just point out in the last 15 years or so, we and other labs have identified a lot of early regulators in ripening that act upstream of ethylene. So we've kind of moved the ball from uh, you know, all the literature, if you go back to the before 2000, we'll talk about ethylene and its role in ripening and how ethylene is regulated. These are basically the things that are regulating the induction of ethylene and other things that are necessary for ripening. So we're, we're continuing to try and explore what those regulators are. I'll stop with one more mutation, just because it's another cool one, and it has some relevance. This is called uniform ripening. Um, and so a wild-type tomato, and don't confuse this when I was talking about wild species, so a normal cultivated tomato, when it's unripe, looks like this. It has what's referred to as a green shoulder. The top is kind of dark green. And the reason for that is because the top of the fruit gets the most sunlight, so it's doing the most photosynthesis, it's providing the most carbohydrate for the maturing, developing fruit. Most of the, the photosynthate in a, a tomato, at least, and many large fruit, is not coming from the fruit itself, but from the adjacent leaves. Right? So most of the photosynthesis, in, you can't really see it here, but in these tomatoes will be from the leaves just above them. All right, but it still is a significant contributor. So about 20% of the sugar ultimately in a fruit is about to come from its own photosynthetic activity. As the fruit ripens, that green shoulder sometimes stays green, sometimes turns yellow, sometimes turns white. You might have seen this on tomatoes before. People consider it not so attractive. So about 100 years ago, a mutation called uniform ripening was identified, and it basically made the whole fruit like the bottom. Right? So it has less chloroplasts, but it's uniform. 
when they ripen, they have uniform color. So this is another mutation that you, is in virtually every tomato you have in the supermarket. It's been bred in. Right? And so it gives uniform color. Consumers tend to like that. Even in places uh, where tomatoes are grown for processing, they use this mutation because it makes it easier to stage when the fruit are ready to harvest. If they're half green, it's kind of hard to say that they're ready to, to pick. Uh, but if they're uniform color, that's an easier choice. So Kong Wen, who did this work in the lab, he actually overexpressed the gene with the 35S promoter and essentially turned the whole fruit into what the top of the fruit used to look like. Uh, and now he gets a very dark green fruit. And when that fruit ripens, uh, it actually gets even more red because it's the chloroplasts that become the chromoplasts that accumulate the chromoplasts. Uh, and they also have more sugars and, um, and produce more volatiles. And so this is a case of kind of unintended consequences where a lot of the features we refer to as quality, other than the appearance of these uniform fruit are reduced. They have less sugars, they have less carotenoids, they typically have less aroma and flavor, but they look better. Um, and, um, and, but in reality, this tomato probably has more nutritional value. And if you're one of these people, who I'm sure none of you are, uh, who are into heirloom tomatoes, when you look for heirloom tomatoes, a lot of people will look for that phenotype because that's a typical characteristic of a tomato bred before kind of World War II, which was about the time when people started breathing in this uniform mutation to a lot of things. Okay, so all right, I'll end with this slide. Um, so this is just a slide of a lot of different mutations that are in tomato that have helped us understand some of the regulatory circuitry. Some of those have practical relevance, like ripening inhibitor and uniform ripening. There's also a mutation called high pigment, that is, a, again, another very interesting mutant. It's basically a tomato plant that believes it's seeing a lot of light. And then because it has this perception that it's seeing a lot of light, when you're out in a lot of light, what do you do? Put on sunscreen. Tomatoes don't have sunscreen, but carotenoids are one of the protective compounds against photooxidation. So they produce more carotenoids. So you get darker red fruit. This is green flesh protein, which is a state green protein, and it basically inhibits that transition of the chloroplast to chromoplast, so the fruits stay a little green. That's what I told you about before, the red and green on top of each other, kind of brown. That's one of the tomatoes you have in the cup. You've got a cup of tomatoes. So, okay, I will stop there.